Well, hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together, God's people say, hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study of the road to Calvary. This is book two, entitled, We Would See Jesus, and this would be part five, where we're going to see Jesus as the door. Now, what we have seen of the Lord Jesus as the awesome truth about ourselves and our sins prepares us for the next sight of him, the sight which the Holy Spirit longs to give to the convicted heart, that of the Lord Jesus as the door. Such a sight of ourselves as we have had must give the convicted heart a sense of utter exclusion from a holy God. If that is what we have been like all the time, and if those are the sins to which we have been blind for so long, little wonder then that God has seemed so far from us, that our hearts have been cold, and that our Christian service has seemed hard and barren. We need look no further for the cause of the deadness that reigns in our fellowship and our churches. Not only does the soul see itself rightfully excluded because of its sin, but knowing its weakness, it wonders if there can be a way to God that a person with a heart like his can tread. Here the Lord Jesus presents himself to us just what we need and confronts us with another great I am. He says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. John chapter 10 verse 9. If the deceived need to see the truth, the excluded need to find a door. And Jesus is both truth to the deceived and door to the excluded. He is the door to revival and every other blessing for the Christian as he is the door to salvation for the lost and a door moreover as easily accessible to the weakest and most felling as to the most saintly. The very fact that the Lord Jesus said he was the door presupposes that there is a wall, a barrier, which excludes us from God. There is indeed. Who of us has not found it so? It has withstood our most earnest moral endeavors and thwarted our every resolution. We go to pray, but it is there. We seek his help, but it is still there. Our very worship of him is ever from a distance. Only those who have never seriously set themselves to seek God can imagine there is no such barrier. The Bible tells us the nature of this barrier. It tells us it is sin, and only sin that separates man and God. Isaiah 59, 2. By sin, it means the attitude of self-centeredness, and independence of God which is common to us all, and the many acts of transgression which have issued from it. It is because we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts that we have offended against his holy laws. And sin always builds a wall between us and God. This wall has not always been there. It was erected only with the first act of transgression. Only then did man want to hide from God. Only then did God in justice have to set the cherubim and the flaming sword to bar the way back to the tree of life. We see this in Genesis chapter 3 verse 24. Since then, all Adam's descendants have been born on the other side of that flaming sword. In the far country of separation from God, into which the first prodigal, father of them all, went. And there men remain until their eyes are open to see the one door back which God has provided for them. I found myself speaking one day to a woman in a counseling room after one of the great crusade meetings which have been held in Britain in recent years. She told me that she had come forward because her son of 16 had done so. I said, but what about you? She replied, oh, I've always been a Christian. The moment she said that, I knew she had never been a Christian at all. No one has always been a Christian. 
but instead always been a sinner, always been separated from God by sin until saved by divine grace. Mere human religiousness does nothing to restore us. Let us not think that this separating power of sin applies only to those who have never known Christ personally. Those of us who have passed initially through the door back to God know all too often the wall that sin can still erect between the soul and God. Though we have been restored from the far country of original sin, sin may yet come in, perhaps in more subtle forms. And we find ourselves, as a result, in other far countries, smaller but nonetheless real. The far country of jealousy or of resentment or of self-pity or of compromise with the world. And there always arises a mighty famine in that land, as it did for the prodigal son. And we begin to be in want. It is not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, as we are told in Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Who of us does not know the coldness of heart towards the Lord, the apparent deadness of the sacred page, and the accumulating defeats in other areas of life because of the barrier that sin in one particular area has brought between us and God? We are not suggesting that the newborn child of God loses his place in the family of God because of sin that has come in, but he does lose his fellowship with his heavenly father. And then famine conditions invariably obtain in his heart until he repents. In those famine conditions, however, the Christian is all too often blind to the real sin or sins that have separated him from God. And therefore, he attempts to deal only with the famine itself rather than with its causes. He may resolve to pray more or to serve God more faithfully. Or he may join himself to a citizen of that country, as the prodigal did, and make worldly alliances in the hope of bringing back a little pleasure to his now joyless heart. All such efforts will always prove futile, and God uses that experience ultimately to show him that it is with sin that he must deal, and what that sin is. However, even when a man knows the sins that have separated him from God, he occupies himself so often with the problem of how not to sin again, rather than with getting back to God and to peace. It is frankly too late for such considerations. Sin has come in and has done its damage. Even if we get the victory and never do that thing again, that fact would never bring us back to rest in joy. The simple truth is that words such as Jesus satisfies does not apply when we are in the far country. All that and much more awaits us only upon our return to the Father's house. It is just here that we flounder for lack of knowing how to get back, how to get through the many barriers that sin has brought with it. If we knew this, we would be radiantly happy souls indeed. Sin, though it might come, would not defeat us with despair and deadness of spirit for we would know a sure way into freedom and joy again, and we could avail ourselves of it just as often as we needed to. Truly, our need then is to see a door, a way of escape. This is the point at which the Lord Jesus meets us again, to the inquiring heart who would ask him to show him the door. He says, in effect, if you had known me, you should have known the door also. He that has seen me hath seen the door. I am the door. By me, if any man enter, he shall be saved. Jesus does not merely show us the door. He himself is the door. This is God's great gift of love to a prodigal world that still has its back to him a never-failing door back to peace and satisfaction. 
if we will but turn and see him standing so near and accessible to us. And such a door is he that neither preparatory steps nor subsequent steps are necessary to enter into what we need. In simply coming to him, we have passed from one spiritual condition to another, for he is himself both the blessing needed and the door to it. It is just such a picture of him as the door that we have in the well-known hymn which begins, Out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus I come, Jesus I come. Into thy freedom, gladness and light, Jesus I come to thee. This picture gives us the basic word of the gospel of Christ. The gospel does not call unto us to try to be like Christ, but rather to come through Christ. We are presented with a door rather than an example. Again and again, we find Paul's epistles punctuated with the phrase, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You can see an example of this in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. He never mentions a blessing or an experience of good that God has for us, but that he hastens to add, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And rightly so. For what use is a delectable garden or a handsome house if there is no open gate or door by which to get there? This is what disappointed Christians are asking for all the time. It is all right to talk about this wonderful life of fellowship with God, they say, but how does a man like me get there? I have tried so often. Well, Jesus delights to tell us, I am how you get there. I am the door. There is no blessing that God has for us, be it salvation, victory, peace of heart, or revival, but that God has provided an easy, accessible door to it in and through his Son. If we are truly to see the Lord Jesus as our door and to experience the blessedness of it, there are four essential things which we must understand about him in that capacity. First, we must see him as the open door, wide open. How easy it is to see him as something other than that. There are times when some of us seem to see him as little more than the one who sets the standard, who delineates the path of duty, and who only censures us when we do not attain it. That is to make him but another Moses, who only causes us to despair. And if we see him as a door at all, it is only as a shut door. But that is not the Jesus from heaven. You see, the law was given by Moses, and he condemned the whole lot of us. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 1, 17. If grace is God's goodness to those who do not deserve it, that means he is an open door through which sinners may come. The hour of its opening was that hour when hanging upon the cross, he cried in triumph, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. As if to make quite clear what was being accomplished on Calvary, the veil of the temple, which for centuries had hung as an excluding barrier between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple, was tore at that very moment rent from top to bottom. In that way, the separating barrier of sin between man and God was declared breached, and the door for sinful man declared open. We are now urged to have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. For the blood of Jesus Christ tells us that all the judgment due to our sin was exhausted on the cross. When we truly see that, even the most self-condemned have boldness to enter in. This means that there is now no barrier or obstacle between man and God. What appear to be the obstacles, man's coldness, his unbelief, 
and other such sins are the very things that qualify him for this door, provided he will acknowledge them, for it is a door for people who are characterized by just such sins. We cannot suppress or conquer these things, but we can judge them as sin and bring them to Jesus. And as we do so, what appeared to be an all-excluding wall is found to be in him an open door, and we have passed into peace and fellowship with God. Second, we need to see this door as open on street level. That is open for the failure as a failure, and not merely for us when we have become a little more successful. The Jews in the New Testament could easily believe that there was salvation for the Gentile if he was circumcised and became a Jew. What they could not and would not believe was that there was salvation for the Gentile as a Gentile without becoming a Jew at all. This was the controversy that dogged Paul's steps in all his years. He insisted all the way through that the Gentile could be saved as a Gentile and the sinner as a sinner without anything to commend him to God but the blood of Jesus Christ. You'll find this elaborated on in Galatians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. In other words, he insisted on seeing Christ as the door open on street level. We Christians would not think of going back on the gospel committed to Paul as concerns them that are without, at least not in theory. But when we think of our own deep needs and failures, and when we pray about being used of God, and when we ask God for revival, we put the door for ourselves somewhere higher than on street level. Here, we instinctively feel that the failure cannot be blessed as a failure, but only as a better Christian. And so we try to make ourselves such. We succeed only in putting the door just beyond our reach, for it is the becoming that little bit better that defies us. And all the time, the door is open on street level, the level of our shame and failure. And all that is needed is the willingness to acknowledge that such is our true condition and to come in faith to Jesus. We sometimes talk about the price of revival, and we need to be very careful as to what we mean when we speak like this. We may place that price so high that we put revival right beyond the reach of the ordinary run of mortals. Maybe that is our way of attempting to justify God, that he has not yet apparently given the revival his people need. But that is a wrong done to God and a cruelty done to his church. There is without doubt a price to be paid for revival, but it is not of necessity the price of long nights of prayer or excruciating sacrifices, but of simply humbling pride to repent of sin. The door is open on street level to revival, as it is to salvation and every other blessing. In coming to him in repentance, we come into revival, for he is himself revival and the simple door to it. If it is contended that this is not the widespread, spectacular revival which is written about and which is needed today, we can only say that such a movement has always begun this way with God being allowed to deal with one person and with that person giving his testimony. May it not be that the reason why God has not blessed us with revival as we have wanted it is that we have sought it not by faith, but by the works of the law, and we have missed the door on street level. And may it not be that we have been expecting to see revival in others rather than being willing to be personally revived ourselves and be the first to admit our need of this. Is it not significant that when there is patently an experience of revival in lives, those revived do not talk about revival, but rather about Jesus. The glorious truth is that Christ is immediately available to us 
as we are and where we are. The Father has made Jesus as accessible to us sinners as he possibly can. Listen to the Apostle Paul on this point when he says, The righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Romans chapter 10, verses 6 through 8. It is not a matter of straining to attain the heights, nor artificially trying to abase ourselves to the depths. His blood has made him available to the sinner as a sinner, and to the felling saint as a felling saint, if he will only admit that that is what he is. The word which we need, therefore, to contact him is right in our mouth and in our heart the simple word of confession and faith. This leads to the next sight that we must have of this wonderful door opened at the cross. It is a low door. That is, we have to bow our heads low in repentance if we are to enter by it. Scripture mentions again and again the disease, if we may call it that, of the stiff neck. It is a figurative way of speaking of man's self-will and stubbornness shown especially in his unwillingness to admit himself wrong. Sometimes you can feel your neck going almost literally stiff when someone accuses you and you resent it. When our necks are like that and our wills unbroken to acknowledge our sin, we can never enter through that door. We just hit our heads against the frame. He bowed his head on the cross for us, and we shall have to bow our heads low in self-judgment and repentance of sin if we are to know the power of his blood to cleanse and bring us into rest. So often the way in which we repent to God and sometimes apologize to another for a wrong shows that we have not truly judged ourselves. We betray the fact that we feel it is only an unfortunate slip and that we have on this occasion acted out of character with our true selves. What deception! The truth is, we have not acted out of character at all, but in accordance with our true form, as declared to us by that figure hanging on the cross for us. Sometimes we should do well to add, when we are putting something right with another, so you see what I really am. The head must be bowed low to the dust to admit that we are no better than what Jesus had to become for us. Then and there we find him a door indeed. Then and there we must understand that this door is a narrow door. Narrow is the gate, said Jesus and straight is the way that leads unto life. At first, the road to the cross seems broad, and we can all go together. But as we get nearer to that place of repentance, the path gets narrower. There is not room for us all abreast. We can no longer be lost in the crowd. Others fall behind. At last, when we come to the one who is the door himself, there is not room even for two, you and that other one. If you are going to enter that door, you will have to stand there utterly alone. It must be you alone who repents, without waiting for any other. But we do not want to be the one to repent. The devil tells us that the other by our side is so very wrong, and he makes us unwilling to repent unless they repent first. But men never get through the door that way. You must be the one to repent and to do so first, as if you were the only sinner in the world. The other may be wrong, but your reactions to their wrong, reactions of perhaps resentment, criticism, or unforgiveness, 
these things are wrong as well, and in God's sight more culpably so. For thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, is second only to thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And those reactions in your heart do not come from love. Jesus never fails as a Savior when we come to him as sinners. But if in any degree we are not finding him a real Savior who brings us fully out of darkness and defeat into light and liberty, it is because on one point or another we are not willing to be broken and see ourselves as sinners. We are now in a position to look at a final picture the Lord gives us in John chapter 10. This time, not so much of the door, but of the way in which we so often miss it. This is what he said in John 10, 1. He that entereth not by the door, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. The first interpretation of this word concerns the false teacher who seeks entrance to the sheepfold as a shepherd, but only to the enrichment of himself and the destruction of the sheep. However, as we look at this man trying to get into the sheepfold by painfully and slowly climbing up the wall, we may see that from another point of view, this is an illustration of what we so often do. He has his fingers and toes in the crevices as he tensely struggles up. Every now and then he falls to the bottom and has to start climbing again. After repeated failures, he is in despair that he will never reach the top and thus get into the sheepfold. But all the time there is the door open for him at street level. Either he has not seen it or he is unwilling to make use of it. Perhaps it is the latter, for he could not enter by that door as a self-styled shepherd but only as a repentant sheep. What a picture this is of the grievous mistake we so often make in our anxiety to get into an experience of salvation or sanctification or revival or some other blessing of which we stand in need. We are not entering by the door, but we are striving to climb up some other way by the way of self-improvement, turning over a new leaf, determining to have longer devotions, trying to witness more, and so on. We see the standard of the victorious life above us, and we are quite sure that if we can attain to it in this or that, particularly we shall be in fellowship with God and filled with his spirit. But it is the attaining to it which all the time defeats us. And all the time we are climbing so hard the Lord Jesus stands immediately available below to us at the door, open on street level, and we could so quickly enter in if we were willing to bow our heads at his cross. All the different and subtle ways by which we tried to climb up some other way are but variants of the way of works which God has declared can never bring us into rest. It may be asked, is it wrong to do such things as have been mentioned? Of course not. They are to have an essential part in every Christian life. But they are valueless if what God is asking us at the moment is to repent about something. Unconfessed sin voids all our religious exercises. Even as it is written, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me. Your hands are full of blood. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 11 through 15. But the human heart would much rather offer to God its works, no matter how costly, than humble itself to confess sin. That is the reason why man is always predisposed to go the way of works. He does not want to bow his head to go through the door. That is the reason also why God has rejected the way of salvation by works or sanctification by works. The way of works is so often but a substitute for repentance. Thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. 
The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Psalm chapter 51, verses 16 to 17. And that spirit always finds its way through the door. Yet another reason why God rejects the way of works as a means to enter into blessing is that it makes Christ of none effect to us. Paul said, if righteousness or any other blessing come by the law, then Christ died in vain. The more tense and striving I become in my Christian service, and the harder I struggle to climb by my efforts over the wall of my coldness of heart, the further I get from grace and from God and from his door open for me. I am, in effect, going about to establish my own righteousness, and I'm not submitting myself to be cleansed from sin in the precious blood of Jesus, our Savior. More than that, such striving never produces peace in our hearts. It only produces despair, for we never feel we have quite reached the top of the wall. But the despair and burden roll away, and relief and joy and praise to God take their place when at last we see Jesus and his finished work. We come down from our unrepentant strivings to those dear, pierced feet of his. And in a matter of moments, we have entered by faith into a peace and rest of heart that has eluded us for so long. Truly, to see Jesus is to lose our burdens and to enter in to satisfaction. And friends, that would be the end of part five in our study we would see Jesus. And I pray that what stood out to you today would be the fact that we are so inclined to work in order to receive. And all we must do is bow humbly at his feet. We strive so hard to climb this wall in hoping that the blessing lies just on top and yet the blessing is never at the top but always at the bottom, in a very low place, found only at the feet of Jesus. How hard it is to do this because we go against our very nature. But friend, if you are seeking blessing this day, you will find it only when you hang your head low in shame, seeing yourself for what you truly are, a sinner in desperate need for a Savior. Now, as he so wills, friends, and until next time, I love you with the love of Jesus, and I'll see you on the next video.